The bark beetles have been on Earth with the conifer trees for a couple hundred million years, and there's only a one or two percentile of these beasts that are actually tree killing. In general, cold temperatures in the northern hemisphere keep their populations in check. Occasionally, we have an outbreak here, there, or other where. And uh, after three, five years, everything normalizes. A lot of trees die, but the beetle population also dies because the cold November temperatures knock them down. Over the last 15 years, Russell, temperatures on Earth have risen so dramatically that the bark beetle populations in Western North America are beyond biblical. We have in 200 million years of paleo, botany, and modern history, we have never seen the populations that are with us well into the trillions. And not only have we never seen this, we've never seen the beetle as far north, now into the boreal or most northern coniferous forests, up into the Yukon and Northwest Territories, and northern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and into Labrador. Is this uh, the same they, as the pine beetle? It is. They, they are the mountain pine beetle, these bark beetles predominantly, but not exclusively. They're not only breeding into the trillions, they've sped up their life cycle by a magnitude of 100%. So some are breeding two in a generation in one, one year. Other species are three, four further south. They're up into the mountains uh, where they've never, ever been to this degree. You know, I guess at a basic level, people need to understand that the role of trees are many fold, but primarily, the trees have been on our planet for over 350 million years. And trees, as it turns out, are the most effective carbon dioxide, carbon storage warehouses that we know of. For every metric ton of wood, a tree has sucked one metric ton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They have created the metric ton of wood and they have given off a metric ton and a half of oxygen. They're just phenomenal long-term organisms that are essential. With the trees dying, uh, the number I'm looking at conservatively in Western North America over the last 15 years is 30 billion uh, mature trees have died. Uh, I, I can't even get my mind around that. In British Columbia, British Columbia has lost half of its commercial forests in the last 15 years, enough to build a city of 5 million homes, but from a biologic point of view, the dead trees, not only are they not sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, they're bleeding greenhouse gases into the ever-rise pool on our planet. In British Columbia alone, 250 million metric tons of greenhouse gases from dominantly large coal pine forests are entering the atmosphere. That's the equivalent of all of the cars and light trucks emissions for a period of five years in Canada. This is our life support system that is not breaking down, it's broken down. And now we're just trying to get a handle on how quickly the game board's changing. It is very disturbing that we have no leadership politically on planet Earth, except I might want to lean. Australia has a carbon tax that they've just put into place. Kudos to them because at least they're trying to get a handle on their carbon footprint. They're all about coal. They, they have very little hydroelectricity there. And so they're trying to exercise some sensibility. And Western Europe has got a little bit of a handle on it. California also has a, a 2020 handle. But the rest of the planet has yet to come to an understanding that global change isn't something that's going to happen in a decade or 2050 or, you know, by the turn of the following century. It is here now. 30 billion dead trees. What more do you want? Now, 
most people say, well, you know, 30 billion, whatever, you know, that isn't what Bill Gates is worth, so that's an inconsequential number. Well, let me tell you why it's consequential. Those trees are bastions for attracting snow and releasing it very slowly for human beings, for agriculture, for instance, and for industries. And when these trees die, the snow doesn't accumulate. It runs off very quickly in the springtime, and it's playing almighty uh, whatnot with our agricultural system. We've just experienced one of the most epic droughts in America in the last century, and that boils down to global food security. So everything is tied in. There is nothing that's like, oh, that happened. Well, that doesn't affect me, really. It affects everybody. When did it all go wrong, Reese? Uh, well, 15 years ago, the temperatures in the Chilcotin in British Columbia, cold temperatures stopped happening. This is an insect that can harden off down and withstand minus 40 degree C, assuming it can get through a step-down process in November. That stopped happening 15 years ago and releasing globally 82 million metric tons of fossil fuels and greenhouse gases daily on our planet. Okay, those are the problems, but we are problem solvers, and it boils down really to one word, energy, and how we source it. The bottleneck is very elemental. Let's turn the hands of time back, and one of my all-time heroes, unbelievable human, Steve Jobs. If everybody told Steve Jobs 40 years ago, you can't do that, you know, your ideas bite, you're not going to get a penny, and we stop the great Steve Jobs. Wow, well, let me tell you, our world would be significantly different. No tablets, or certainly no tablets like his tablet, no iPhone, no iPod, no computer where you didn't need to be an engineer to the 50th degree. Where I'm going with this is innovation, ladies and gentlemen, is our best friend. And when we say, oh, no, you can't innovate, you know, that's a way of uh, eradicating our species. Our best friend is our brain. And if you're only you're talking about how we source energy, come on. There's a trillion times, a hundred million times, 10 to the 5,000 of leaves every day on our planet that make a living from sun. We've got energy from waves that lap the shoreline daily. They're creating twice the amount of energy we use globally on our planet. Winds, waves geothermal, sun. Now, you can't tell me at the centers of excellence in North America worldwide that if you allow scientists, allow them with a few research dollars to figure out a new energy source we can't, come on, we're going to put somebody on Mars in the next decade. You better bet we can. not But we can't if we say innovation sucks. And you line up any individual that's on national TV or radio who openly comes out and says innovation sucks, they will be excoriated because innovation is what will propel our species into the next century. But it's not in 50 years. It's not in 30 years. It's not in 20 years. It is now. And we know, you know, we know. And I'm, I'm an inveterate optimist, but uh, no more wasting time. I find there to be a poetic irony there between the innovation of Steve Jobs and how he died. The can yeah. cancer, a totally treatable preventable, curable problem. Yeah, and well, you another know, another program. Yeah, it is, but we have the capacity. There is nothing any human being cannot do. It's how badly do you want to do it now, and one word, focus. You focus, you'll get it. Dr. Reese, is there a website my audience can visit? Yeah, sure, drreese.com. That's D-R-R-E-S-E.com. Uh, from there, you can get to a number of my little portals, and there are probably five, 700 stories that people can read, and there's a contact button, and, you know, it's a big world. I'm open, and uh, I love kids, and I encourage every family to encourage their young to embrace nature, embrace the wonders. And if you don't know, ask questions. Find somebody who does. Get a couple mentors. Please pick up the insatiable bark beetle. Dr. Reese, honored to have you on the program. Yeah, thanks, Russell. Anytime.